All right, sir. It's the new year. Good morning. Good morning. So everyone and their cousin is new year, new me. People are flying like a bat out of hell to go to Target and buy red and pink Valentine's Stanley cups. Not me and not judging, but also that's kind of insane. Uh, but I, I started thinking about yesterday and considering, you know, us coming on here, what we might talk about and words of wisdom and such. But we're at that point of the year where everybody wants to be able to turn this massive new leaf over. And in weeks prior, we've talked about, especially within the ag ed realm, uh, some of the obstacles and barriers that have prevented people from being able to like really level the F up. And so I wanted to see if we could spend some time talking about what it looks like to be assertive, what that means, why we take it the wrong way, um, maybe even talking a little bit about the importance of having spaces where that can happen so that not just individuals, but when we start looking at an entire profession, how do you, how do you really proactively get it to grow and get it to evolve over time? So that's kind of like, that's where my brain juices are sitting this morning. Um, but let's just, let's start with that. Like what were your early what was your early definition or what was your early, I guess, relationship with that word assertive or assertiveness? So I feel like it goes even further back than the ag ed industry. And when I was in the profession, <clears throat> excuse me. So when I was a kid, I felt like there was always a right and wrong way to do things. And I don't know why that came about, if it was just conditioning through, you know, my family structure or through friend groups or whatever. but as a kid that lacked confidence and the ability to speak up and be heard. Um, I think I was heard when I actually spoke up, but I just was always afraid to speak up um, due to feeling like I was wrong, right? Or didn't want to be wrong. And so as I got into the ag ed world, you know, as a student teacher, I would observe and see how certain people did things. Um, not that they did it wrong, right? I, I really feel like it's more gray than it is black and white. But I would notice things that people, you know, the way things were, right? This is how we do things here at Madeira. This is how we do things here at, this was the big one, Hillmar. <laughs> you know, going to Hillmar as a student teacher, it's like, oh man, you got to get there. You got to be the first one there. You got to make coffee, you know. You got to be at everything. You got to show them that you're dedicated. And if you can, you know, prove, make it through this boot camp, then you've earned your your respect as a student teacher and as a new teacher in the industry, which was true to some extent. But a lot of that was bullshit, to be honest. It wasn't really, it yeah. wasn't really that way. Maybe it was at one point in time, but it wasn't when I was there. Um, but there was always this perception of like, you know, you're caught in between well, this might be a better way to do it, but this isn't the way this program, you know, operates. And if we change things, how are people going to accept that, right? Because people want things that are predictable. They want um, to be, you know, in, an, in another way, and this is maybe more of a self-fulfilling prophecy, but they want to be the ones that, you know, honor the code or develop yeah. the code. And so there's this ego involved with it as well. <clears throat> and so again, as a young teacher coming in, it's like I had ideas, but I was afraid to communicate my ideas to programs, coworkers, um, you know, even administrative staff, because you don't know what that's going to look like, right? How are they going to perceive it? They might just shoot you down. Like, that's a stupid idea. We're not doing that. Like, <laughs> oh. Right. It has to be your idea. That's why. When it's your idea, then it's totally different. But when it's my idea, it's oh. like, you don't know shit. You're a new teacher. Like, well, you know, I just have a different perspective than you do. Oh, my God. Like somebody who's been in the industry for 10, 15 years and is just stuck in the old way. Right. Yeah. And I love I love how you word that, too, because it's there's room. I think we get stuck sometimes in mindsets where like things have to be mutually exclusive. Like if this is true, then that means this is false. And really they could be true at the same time. 
right? And it, and it goes to your, your perspective and your experience. We can have some traditions in a profession or in an industry that are significant uh, traditions that have allowed maybe that profession or that group of people to expand and excel and grow and do really phenomenal things. Tradition can be upheld and supported while you continue to expand and go to the next level. Like, I think you can have both. And in the times where you've got to make a choice, can it be okay to like change our minds? Can it be okay to decide, hey, what we did for 150 friggin' years, like that was great. That worked for 150 years. We're not at that place anymore. And if we want to continue being, you know, if we want to slow that attrition rate after year five, <laughs> maybe we got to do some shit different. And when you talked about like kind of even going back before ag ed, your early connections with being heard and asserting yourself, oh man, we would need a whole different universe for me to be able to <laughs> even talk about how I related to that as a kid, just given the unfortunate stuff that happened in my childhood. But I remember those same moments. I remember the feeling of I have an idea or I have something I need to say. I have something I need to tell and talk about, but I couldn't do it. Or I had such little self-agency and self-belief because of the structures that I was being raised in, family, religion, uh, some of the traditions in all of those different groups, like you're not supposed to speak up to your elders. You're not supposed to say no. You're not like, oh, Right. And so then as you fast forward, and even as I got out of some of those situations and then coming into a profession, as you said, that has such a structure, such a hierarchy, and not that some of those highly esteemed or notorious programs, it's not to say that all the people for the history of ever doesn't mean that they're the problem or part of it, but like, we also, within large groups and organizations, we have to at least be willing to come to the frame of mind that we can love what we do and we can still identify the parts of our system that are maybe a little fucked up and then decide, okay, we're aware of it. Now let's just do something different. Mm -hmm. it, it could be a minor, it could be a minor tweak. It doesn't mean we're dismantling an entire system. It just means, hey, this one part is maybe causing part of you know, that cog that's like out of whack. And if we tweaked it a little bit, shit, like that might be the game changer, you know? Absolutely. Well, and you look at um, like businesses, extremely successful businesses, and you have a business that started, I don't know, using an example, maybe printers, right? Back in the eighties. And I've read on, on certain situations like this before, those types of uh, businesses that don't evolve with the times they don't make it right if you're not growing if you're not implementing new ideas and, and somewhat and, and i'm not saying a full-on change with the times right but adjusting and being able to pivot on certain things because things are always changing right there's different fads there's different ideas there's technology now technology is so significant in our our world compared to five, 10, 20 years ago, right? And so a company, rest in peace, but like Circuit City, yeah. <laughs> I used to go there. I used to go there and buy CDs, right? Uh -huh. Who the fuck has CDs anymore? Nobody, right? We have Apple Music. We got Spotify. We have Pandora. No like we, no, nobody messes, that, <laughs> nobody even remembers Circuit City because they ultimately weren't able to adapt with the times. And so, you know, you have to be, malleable you have to have an open mindset and be able to adjust and if you're not then you're not going to grow ultimately and and so i mean there's there was another thing to that as well um you know the industry i currently work in which is agriculture as well when i came in as a service manager i thought mm, this isn't going to be too bad right it's going to be kind of like teaching at the college in a diesels program and you're just going to be assigning them jobs and just doing a little bit of paperwork it's going to be pretty easy I didn't know shit about what I was doing and for five months I mean you know when a teacher is trying to bullshit a lesson yeah it was that same thing <laughs> the, the students know that you yeah. have no idea what you're doing 
and they either a take advantage of it or b don't respect you like you you're not qualified for this is ultimately what it was and so i was trying to figure out what i should be doing again there's a right way and a wrong way in my mind so there was no gray area and then i was also trying to implement the things and do the things that i knew i could do well while trying to be somebody else yeah and in that what i learned is and our company works with a leadership consultant her name is christina curtis she has a book out called choosing greatness she's an incredible human being our first meeting with her she looked at me and she's like this was kind of off topic a little bit she's like you look like you got your shit together and i'm like well that's a pretty good compliment i appreciate that anyway she didn't know me and nobody else there knew me because i was still new to the company but what she said at the end of it after getting to know us is she's like you are the type of person that has things good to say you're just afraid to say them mm. and when you speak up people listen but you have to be willing to speak up and put yourself out there and so as I adopted that mindset and learned there isn't just black and white, there's gray, I started to become more of myself. And it's interesting in, you know, my, my current job, how things have evolved, sure. how the culture is more my culture than it was the culture before when I started, because there was no, there, there was a culture, it was just an existing culture, and they were hesitant to change. Now that I've learned my role, I've been myself, I've spoken up and done what I think is best for the business and for, for the service department, mm -hmm. they begin to trust me and begin to accept that. But people are always going to be hesitant to change. And so, you know, it's, all, it's, it's just a long journey. It's, it, it requires persistence. Oh, God, that made me think of a couple things. Um, oh, so taking taking that knowledge that you have now and like firsthand experience of, you know, <laughs> don't know what it feels like when you're kind of faking it in the moment and waiting for that right time, which I don't know ever exists, but like, when do you start, when do you start really showing up and taking the chance of speaking up and, and trying to invoke some positive change, kind of taking that, how would you, how would you suggest then folks that are still in ag ed and based on the data we've looked at in other episodes, there's so many, and we're not broken, but there's so many different things that are still happening, issues they're facing, continuing to try and battle that attrition rate, looking at, you know, representation and male, female, and all of these different groups and what that means for programs. Like, how do you take ideas? So if you're someone in the profession, new, old, doesn't matter, but let's say you've got, you've got some ideas or a feeling, something you've tried. And you really think that if you expanded it within the profession, you could help make some shit better. How do you take ideas like that and share them in a system that's kind of like predisposed to not be open to it? Like, how do we help those people figure out how to do it that are kind of coming at it from inside you know what i mean mm -hmm. so in my opinion there's there's two things to that number one is having the self-confidence and knowing that you just got to be willing to try it like just give it a go and see and you're probably going to get shot down by your department but maybe start if you can if applicable start your idea within your own classroom because at least there you're the captain of your own ship like unless you're in a super toxic environment, nobody's telling you how you should be teaching your classes. Like people will give you pointers, mentors will help you kind of give some advice, but in your classroom, that's your world. And the students will adapt to your world. Now there's, there's a caveat to that, right? Because when you replace somebody, you're one at a new school, whether you're a new teacher, whether you're an existing teacher that's moved locations, they're always going to fight back. Then. Well, that's not the way so-and-so did it. Like, I don't really give a fuck. This is the way that I do it. Yeah. You're going to like some things. You're going to see some similarities between me and so-and-so. But at the end of the day, this is my world. And this is the way we're going to do it. And to see that growth over time is pretty, pretty interesting. But that's a totally different, yeah. different road to go down, right? But trying those, implementing those ideas in your classroom 
and watching them work or don't work is a good way to at least have an idea if it's it's going to work or not, I guess, for about lack of a better term. The second thing is, and this one is really important, people, and you and I have talked about this before, people listen to fit people. So if you are somebody who has their fitness in check and your body composition looks good, chances are you feel good and you're more confident because of that. People that are fit are going to, to be able to get a, their point across and their ideas across more effectively than people who are completely out of shape. And that's just the truth of it. And if you don't think that's right, look at any successful business. Look at a lot of these people on Instagram that are, have huge followings. Most of them, most of them are fit. And the reason being is because they know that that attracts not only audiences, but it also helps establish their, not dominance, but hierarchy or authority in, in like people listen to them, right? Because they know they got some shit figured out. They at least have their body figured out. They probably got their mind figured out. So what, what else do they know? You know, they want to listen to that. Yeah. And for people listening, okay, we're not saying because I'm not, right? We're not saying that everybody needs to be a size two, wearing a string bikini, like flashing it online. That's not what it is. But I, I completely agree with you having been on both ends of the spe- on both ends of the spectrum. I used to like sitting here right now, a few years ago, I was holding on to an extra 50, 60 pounds. And I'm not body shaming. I'm not saying anything against people that are in that same situation. It was really freaking hard um, getting the baby weight to come off. And it didn't work with all the things that people said <laughs> that it was going to happen with. But the point that I agree with is this. I was miserable for freaking ever. I complained about it all the time and nothing changed until I changed. Nothing changed until I started making small shifts in my behavior, starting to work on my mindset, replacing some clean pre-workout instead of the at least one large fountain Coca-Cola per day, usually hand-delivered by a senior that was very late to class, right? (laughs) But as that started to change, you're 100%. It doesn't matter what the number on the scale is. It doesn't matter what like size clothes I'm wearing. What made the biggest impact is that I started to change what I was doing and I felt different. I felt better in my skin. So then the confidence I had when I was speaking up and as with now, like I've never been real shy, but as soon as I started getting the self-confidence, I started running for different leadership positions. I started taking on a greater role in the profession above and beyond like my own department, because sometimes, sometimes we were driving other times they could give two shits about what I was doing. And that's okay. Especially, especially now, right? <laughs> like not in it. Um, but yeah, like to, to hindsight's kind of 2020. And when I just look at that, even the last year, year and a half that I was in the classroom, the biggest shift started happening when I was just taking better care of myself. Um, and then I was, I was more willing to have that confidence to just speak my mind or try something. Um, oh God, those are great points. I love That's, that. Uh, I mean, it, it really is something that I, I think people take for granted, but that you made a great point there. You started to get more involved in the industry as a leader, the more you invested into your own personal development. And at that point, you trust yourself more because you've seen yourself be able to make strides and accomplish things. And, and again, I don't want to take away from, um, you know, people in the industry that have, you know, 10 years under their belt and have all these accolades to, to yeah. represent them. I mean, those people, they get listened to, they, they for sure get listened to no matter what their body composition, composition looks like. But in order to get your voice heard in, in a more effective way and, and to be able to have that confidence to, for example, like you said, speak or, or uh, speak at you know, different events or be involved in CATA or uh, put on workshops. It wasn't until year three ish where I actually felt confident enough to put on a workshop at CATA. And I was like, 
sweating bullets i'm like nobody's gonna fucking listen to me right i'm just i'm a third year teacher and it was amazing how many people actually showed up and got something out of it and it was really cool because i felt like at that point now i was giving back to that community and i had a presence i had a platform that i could portray these ideas and help (laughs) excuse me help uh not increase but like activate somebody else's program right their class like okay Corey's teaching small engines and he's doing this and he is seeing success with it maybe if i implement that my small engines classes will get a little bit better maybe a lot better i don't know but just to be able to share those ideas and stuff it really takes confidence and that confidence comes from again investing in yourself with i mean that's going to be the theme of, of pretty much everything we say here but investing that time and energy into yourself and making sure you're the best version of you And it goes, it goes back to what we've discussed in, in prior episodes where, you know, I think to break this down, what we're, what we're saying is no matter where you're at in your career in ag ed, right. That at some point you're going to, you're going to get to that place where you're like, God damn, I wish so-and-so would just hear me on this issue or this idea because it could X, Y, Z sometimes you might have an answer or a solution and it might not be the time that it's going to be listened to or implemented yet in the times where you can't control how much is happening externally return to the things that are in your control what is in your control as you said what you're doing in your classroom experiment implement this idea this whatever it might be find a way to kind of like you said Um, do a trial run in your classroom, Um, things that you can control and return back to your mental health, your nutrition, your physical health and strength and mobility. And I think two things, like you said, are happening. You're improving yourself and building your own confidence that are going to support you as you do those other things moving forward. But also people see you being consistent as fuck. And when you are that consistent and people see you getting results physically, mentally in your workspace, all of a sudden you've got, um, I don't know if agency is the right word, but above and beyond self-agency, all of a sudden, yeah, they care. They want to know what Corey has to say, right? And especially then if what you're sharing is duplicatable, if somebody can take what the idea that you have, you have the way that you're doing something in your classroom, how you're running a certain team. If somebody else can hear that information, hear that solution, and we can duplicate it above and beyond this one person, then I think the rubber hits the road. You start seeing some real change. Absolutely. And, and you made another good point there as well. Like this whole being able to make adjustments in your, your own little world there, right? Think about it. I mean, if you're teaching your first year, your lessons are going to be more than likely subpar, right? I had so many lessons my first year. I'm like, well, I totally explained that wrong. And and there's another piece to that where I was accountable for that. And so if I did explain something incorrectly, I would literally come back the next day and be like, hey, Love it. I told you this was the right way. This is actually incorrect. This is how it actually works. We're learning together here. I, I apologize, but this is... I'm making it right. Right. But, you know, my lessons from year one to year three were completely different. And and the reason being is because you learn what works and what doesn't work. And then you kind of double down on that. But think about somebody who's been teaching the same classes for 10, 15, 20 years, right? Are you on autopilot? I mean, are you teaching the same fucking lesson day after day, period after period? And some people, they have two preps, right? So you're teaching the same damn thing and your mind goes on autopilot. Everything goes on autopilot or you can adjust those lessons and be like, okay, I taught it this way last period. Let me try this, this period and see if this works, right? You can do those same things with your habits. And again, we need a whole episode on that, like rituals, routine habits, things that you, we, that you do, that I do that have proven successful but again it goes back to that stagnant piece like if you just teach it the way so-and-so taught it or the way you've always taught it you're not going to grow like we have to be relatable we have to be able to to 
adjust and and be able to pivot and make those those moves to increase the the value of what what it is that we're doing or was doing as an ag teacher Mm -hmm. yeah and as as we're talking about um finding ways to assert yourself in not just your day-to-day teaching but asserting yourself in the profession finding ways to bring the ideas and the solutions to light i think back to other like regional regional meetings summer conference different sessions where there's like a large group we're having a collective conversation a few people speak up and maybe uh, maybe there's a little bit of fire in the room there's some like key you know uh points of contention perhaps not like a fight but you know what i mean like there's some different thoughts happening and they kind of like combat each other as i think back to some of those sometimes it would be little things like I remember when we came back, or at least we're trying to come back from COVID initially, there was the split in the camp was continue allowing stuff to happen on Zoom versus mandating you're either there in person or you're out. And I remember specifically like finding myself in both camps at different times, right? Sometimes I was the person that was like, yeah, like we're back. Let's go. Let's do the things like be here. The community, the culture is so significant. We need people. We need everybody close to the fire for this thing to really come back and for us to be able to move forward. And then some other things kept happening. And I just remember the number of people that had some other shit happening in life whether it was maternity leave and maybe they're from a smaller program or a single you know teacher program and it's them and they're the one that's on leave but they still need representation thinking about people that have medical leaves different stuff happening like there were real situations where what if by allowing zoom to have like still been a thing um those people could have stayed closer to the fire instead of having to make that hard choice that no, like I can't be here. I'm going to miss the information. I can't get my voice heard. I'm not going to get to vote on stuff. Things are just going to happen regardless of me being there or not. And I have to go do this thing, you know, as well we should, because family should always come first. Um, But I remember us having a conversation that last year that I was teaching about, hey, the number of people that absolutely despise the fact that we would have our central region meeting the weekend that Thanksgiving break was starting. And then some of the key people like veteran people who always magically, like they'd be able to leave and go be on vacation that week. The rest of their department better have their ass in the seats. Right. And it was my anniversary weekend. I never fucking missed one. Even when Georgia was six weeks old and I facilitated a workshop, my ass was there. Right. But we go to have a vote just to open the conversation. It was a whole, it was a whole mess. Um, And so I guess before I get stuck down a rabbit hole. (laughs) It happens. I know, but it's like, there's just little things, little things like that though. You know, Um, what if we like, what if we just talked about it different? What if we found alternative ways to make space for people Because if you want to keep people close to a fire, if you want to stop attrition rates, just for a few minutes, can we consider some alternative practices that might elongate someone's career that might, you know, extend um, the time that people are staying in the profession, you know, before burnout, before, I don't know. Well, like, like you're, I feel like what you're saying is, and and I know this to be true because I feel great when I have an idea and everybody's like, or most people are like, that's a good idea, yeah. you know, but most people don't want to tell you that because I, I don't know, again, it's an ego thing. Like, you don't know shit. You're a new teacher, blah, blah, blah. Just shut up, you know, go to the meeting Thanksgiving week, be there. I might not be there, but you need to be there. Like you're saying, like you were saying, um, but I think there's, if there was more of that, if there was more open-mindedness and, you know, I had conversations with people that I consider mentors in the industry and they would, 
you know, do things. They had been done, done things differently for 10, 15 years. And then I come in and they have to observe one of my classes. And then we talk about it afterwards, right. Through, through mentorship training or whatever. Sure. And then after it didn't usually happen the first year, but like second, third year, they're kind of like, I like how you did that. That's actually a really good idea, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, okay, yeah, see, I, I can come up with good ideas too. Right. Like, the old way isn't the only fucking way we can all collectively put our heads together and there's always got to be a leader. Right. So that whole, and and I know this is politically incorrect, the whole too many chiefs, not enough Indians type thing that creates more problems than, than what we're talking about, but to keep people involved in the industry, you know, if they feel like their voice isn't heard or they feel like, they're stuck in this stagnant position that's never going to evolve, never there. It's not going to allow them to evolve subconsciously and instinctually. They are going to migrate into a different realm. That's, that's just the way it's going to be because again, we as people know that we need to evolve and mm -hmm. some people are more accepting of it and understanding of it than others. But if you're stuck, then you have to deal with this for the yeah. next possible 30 35 years why the hell would you stay you know right. why would you stay in that industry that's never gonna it's, other than your paycheck going up with cost of living adjustments and whatnot nothing else is gonna change until that old crew right eventually fizzles out and then now you're could be 20 25 years in your career you're like okay well now it's brucey's time to shine you know right like now it's my that's, turn that's it <laughs> that's the ego piece because it's like even if you even if you despise a certain part of a system or a structure or you know it's dysfunctional as fuck like you still want your turn to be at the top of the hierarchy you still want your turn to be at the top of the totem pole getting to be the one that like all right, 25 years. Now I get to X, Y, Z. It's my turn to pass this off to so-and-so, or it's my turn to like stick my feet in the ground and say, no, even though deep down you are way more intuitively designed or talented to do X, Y, Z, I want to do it because it's what I want. Right? Like, mm -hmm. yes, 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 yes. And yes. It the ego, the ego thing is probably the biggest issue to that, again, because a lot of the people that are further along down the road that have made it through this, you know, and maybe it's some kind of um, sense of accomplishment to yeah. have been, you know, just shut up, little one, you don't know anything for so long. And now they're, you know, 10, 15 years into their career, and they get the opportunity to be a department lead or, or department head or, uh, you know, are, are the, the veteran teacher in the in the department now they want to do the same shit that was done to them which is suppress and i'm not saying this is for all certain circumstances so chill out people but you know for for the majority of those situations you're gonna treat people lower than you in in some sense the way that you were treated why can't we change the fucking mold why can't you do it differently and be like you know what i want your opinion what do you think that we could do differently? What have you experienced in your time student teaching? Brand new teacher, right? What did you experience in your time student teaching? What did you like about it? What did you not like about it? I don't know if those conversations are happening. Because again, if you've been there, done that, then there's this mentality that you know it all already and that they don't know anything. Well, you know, they have different life experiences than you. Yeah. There's some things and 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 they're an asset in a way that brings something to the table that could change things in a way that has never been thought of before right. then what what does your program look like then and now if that person's idea has been implemented as a young teacher think about the confidence that they have think about the feeling of being an asset that they have they're more likely to be like you know what I can do some things I'm actually I'm I'm a part of this department I'm as big as anybody in here so I'm going to work even harder at this. I'm going to put more thought into this and we're going to grow this bitch. Yeah. And how much <clears throat> in the times that I remember that happening just personally, the level of appreciation that I had just for being heard, even before something gets implemented or celebrated or agreed to or whatever, just being heard 
in that way, the appreciation I had to the people who were part of that conversation or situation, whatever it was, all of a sudden I'm going to be your biggest fan. I'm going to be a walking, talking billboard for this department, this region, this profession, right? Because of the experience I had, as opposed to every time getting shut down or dismissed or not even allowed to show up as your authentic self. Then every time that I was at family shit or doing stuff with friends, which was (laughs) seldom, um, it was always like coming from a place of, I loved what I did with the kids, but I was mentally exhausted from the merry-go-round of bullshit. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It was exhausting. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as I, and this is for me personally, I'm not saying, I'm not encouraging people to leave the profession. We want people to stay in the profession. That's we just right. do it yeah. with a different mindset and to be way more effective than probably we ever were. But as soon as I, as soon as I transitioned out and started really implementing the things that I had been figuring out for myself, I was unrecognizable to my closest circle of friends. And that's how I know that if I could take what I'm doing now and have been doing it while I was still in the classroom, when I was still in the profession, it would have been infinitely different. There's a totally different life involved with that and a different world where Pauline is still teaching because things weren't necessarily stuck in the old way. Right. And, and to myself too, I mean, I, I remember at year three thinking, I don't know if I can do this for the rest of my life. I mean, it was cool. And I had seen some things implemented that, that some were department ideas, some were other people's ideas, some were mine, some were students' ideas, some were student teachers' ideas. I told a student teacher that I, I had, that had student taught under me at one point. The other day, we were just messaging back and forth. And I was like, dude, I learned as much, if not more from you than you learned from me. I yeah. mean, just watching the way that you do things, the way you interact with students, the the ideas that you bring to the table, because they're they're a fresh mind, right? Like, I there's things that I implemented that I learned from student teachers, and that's like, well, they don't know shit. Well, yeah, they do. They you know they just think about things a little bit differently, and if you're open minded to it, you can adjust. But but to your point, I mean, there's for the attrition, right, and and keeping people engaged mm. and bought in it requires that feeling of we can evolve and and that we can still maintain not maintain but like increase our our development as a person while in the industry and that is the goal of this conversation this podcast this youtube video whatever this is that's the goal is to make ag teaching fun again you know what i mean like <laughs> Like yeah. j- just get people to where they can live. They can work as an ag teacher for 30 years and be like, but I fucking did everything that I wanted to do. Not just in the profession, in my life. I was a good no. dad. I was spending a lot of time with my family. Like my life was a great life. I can look back and be like, dude, this was awesome. Versus, yeah, well, retired. And I look at the pictures and all the trophies that I won. And now what? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So to help us close, uh, to close this episode out, can you share maybe a a call to action for everybody watching? Um, A call to action, something that you would encourage or push them to do this next week, this next month, along the veins of kind of reasserting themselves into their life or into their career. So you said new year, new me, right? I mean, that's what some people are doing. That's not what I'm doing. <laughs> that's just happening in like the Twitterverse is what Mr. Patton used to say. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's a, a different world. But some people are in that mindset, new year, new right. me. Well, mm-hmm. as you transition back into the into school and school starts up again for the spring semester, implement some ideas. Be genuine with your own ideas in your classroom. Try it out. If it doesn't work, that's okay. It's not a failure, but these ideas, these things you've been looking to speak up to your department about or or these different um, 
you know, workshops that you've been thinking about being a part of because you think you do a pretty good job in the classroom, now's the time to start building those things up and start working towards that next step, right? Again, it's a new year. This is a new you. Do things differently. See what happens. Implement some of those ideas. Watch them come to fruition and see yourself, your department, your classroom, your school, your program. Watch it grow. I don't even want to say anything after that. That was so good. No, it's your turn. <laughs> if I could... If I could quantify it, put a number on it, because I know people like measurable stuff, right? Like it can't just be frou-frou. I would say my call to action, pick something to be 1% better at every single day, right? And you and I have talked about before the whole like, you know, going after the elephant. You're not going to eat that sucker <laughs> in one chunk, right? You've got to take little bites. The beauty between, or the beauty behind rather, this like 1% improvement every single day by the end of the year, you're 365% farther, more evolved, more on fire than you were at the beginning. And it's a 1% difference. So maybe it's waking up 10 minutes earlier. Maybe it's going to bed 30 minutes sooner. Maybe it's spending five minutes in gratitude, maybe whatever. Pick something, pick an area that you know you could use a little growth in and do something towards it that helps you improve 1% every single day. And I guarantee in a week, you start feeling different. And then when that compounds over time, it's just electric. So there we have Amen. it. Amen. We'll see you next time, friends. And remember, defy the standard. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share. And we'll be seeing you next Monday.